anyone in Rochester see the code to get in is 499978. Again, the code is 499978. Again, that number is 499978. Hey Zara, it's me, Zara. I like your name there. <laughs> Mike, uh, let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit closer on me for this first part. Thank you. Need everybody to log in. Uh, as always, we've made a copy of the questions uh, and the options without answers. Uh, Don has made them available as a PDF or electronic document on your canvas. So if you want to uh, download Rainy? that to take notes. Rainy? Yes. Are, Rainy, are you, are you sending your kahoot this way so everybody can see it? Um, all right. So you can't see it in, in there, down there? Uh, not yet. Okay. Mike, is there a way for us to project that down there or do we have to kind of redo? How's that? Can you see that? Absolutely perfect. Oh, perfect. I love hearing. I'm so rarely perfect. Actually, I'm never perfect, so this is great. All right, I think we still have a few more to get in. All right, is everyone ready to go? Uh, let me go ahead and uh, everyone have your name plates out. Uh, Molly, would you close the door, please, so we don't disturb the uh, lab group? All right, everybody. Are we ready to go? Here we go. Pain relief is a basic human right, true or false? Very good. It is a basic human right. Now remember on the first one we always give 20 seconds, then after this everything will be 10 seconds to answer. So uh, this is where having your PDF of the questions and the options will help. All right, let's see. Mouse is being a little tricky here. All right, Xavier is uh, on point and followed by Anne and Aaron uh, and then Catherine and Meg. Let's see what happens next. Hmm, the new interface is interesting. Okay. Pain relief is a basic legal right. True or false? All right. True. Uh, that is something that the American Bar Association, you saw their logo there a moment ago, um, they ha uh, have done a white paper and put it out there that it is a basic legal right. Um, and one of the things is there's actually some landmark cases in the 80s and 90s where people died in unrelieved pain that won some uh, big court cases that helped kind of uh, improve patient care as a result of that. All right, Xavier and Ann still at the top. JW breaks into the top five. All right, uh, Catherine maintaining, climbed up a point, and there's Claire. All right. Chronic persistent pain warns people of injury or disease. Thus, it is protective. Think back to your reading.
results. Very good. That what would be uh, the type of pain that warns people of injury or disease and is protective? Acute. Acute. Very good. Very good. Um, all right. See, uh, B. Horst is, and Ryan and Kirsten broke into the top five there. Um, all right. What is a quality of acute pain? Right, they're all right. So if you chose anything, you got this point, okay? So acute pain is of short duration. It has an identifiable cause. There's limited tissue damage, partly because the warning, you stop whatever you're doing um, to kind of pull back from that and get some treatment. Uh, uh, and it hampers activity and self-care. So all of these things are true of acute pain. I'd like to throw in some of those, uh, make you feel good. All right. All right, Maggie broke, breaking into the top five, and then Austin is our highest climber with 21 places. All right, Austin. <laughs> Chronic pain is psychological, not physical. True or false? All right. So this is a common misperception that, um, oh, you've got chronic pain, it's all in your head. Oh, you've got emotional problems. That's why you're always complaining, you're drug seeking, all this different stuff. And that is not an accurate description at all. And so one of the things we want to do today is kind of bust some myths so that you can give better care and not be thrown by misconceptions. All right. Xavier continues to dominate uh, with uh, JW, Kirsten, Ryan, and B Horse there. Uh, we have 15 players who just hit uh, answer streak of three. So people are on a roll. Look out. All right. This heightens perception of pain and decreases coping activity. lack of sleep. So uh, sleep is incredibly important and so a lack of it can really um, impact pain. What I would also say to you is uh, sleep is important for a number of reasons um, and part of it is memory. So I want you to remember because I always say that nursing school is like a sleep disorder. Uh, hey, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so one of the things is you can study, 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 but if you're not getting adequate sleep, you're not going to transfer that information from your short term into your long term memory. So remember, sleep is an important part of health. All right, Xavier, JW, Kirsten, Ryan, and Lauren three. Lauren's not number three. She's broken into the top five, so she's on top there. All right. Uh, let's see what we got next. Pain is a natural part of aging. Older patients report more pain as they age. True or false? False. This is another myth that we need to bust. Uh, well, you're getting older, you're just going to be in pain, so just deal with it. Uh, no, pain is telling us something and we need to be treating it effectively. Um, not just with drugs, but with non-pharmacological interventions as well. One of the things that I always say is, pain is a multidimensional problem. Our treatment of it must be multidimensional as well. All right. So, uh, okay, top five is holding. Nine players have reached an answer streak of five. All right. Next question is, some cultures believe enduring suffering is necessary to enter a higher state of being or heaven. That is true, yeah. We found that some branches of Buddhism, there's people who practice this, um, believe this. Um, different other cultures, it's about being stoic. Um, coming here from Tennessee, uh, I learned a lot about um, Northern European and Scandinavian culture when I moved up here. And uh, there was this one joke I heard that actually really informed my nursing care in the ICU. Uh, do you know what this Scandinavian man said before he died? I'm fine. <laughs> so um, you can find sometimes that people are, can be very, very stoic or very not stoic. So there's, there's a lot of different things that are going on there. All right. Uh, Sydney, welcome to the top five. Never administer an opioid and non-opioid analgesic at the same time. 
true or false? All right, that is false with an exclamation point. You should be combining things. Who's who? Raise your hand in Rochester and here if you've ever heard of a drug called Percocet. Okay, Percocet is an opioid mixed with um, acetaminophen in the same tablet. You'll find other uh, Vicodin. Have you heard of that? Again, a, a opioid mixed with an acetaminophen in a single pill. Um, again, multi-dimensional problem. You need a multi-dimensional response. I see a question here, Gina. Uh, NSAIDs would be included under the umbrella of non-opioid analgesics, yes. Rainey, can yes. you just remind your students to use their um, mics when they talk? Uh, they don't have mics here. Um, we'll, we'll work on, um, I'll cue Mike, do a better job of cueing Mike when we go to that. All right. Not a problem. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up. Ibuprofen should not be taken by a patient with a history of uh, liver damage. Um, binge drinking, uh, stomach ulcers, or clots like DDTs. All right, ibuprofen should not be taken by a patient with a history of, okay, uh, ibuprofen belongs to what drug class? NSAIDs. What you, on the thing in your, that you looked at that we prepped you for, uh, what can NSAIDs cause? Yeah, exactly. Stomach ulcers, excellent. So if you already have them, you don't want to worsen them, so you want to be careful with that. All right, uh, top five is holding. And uh, now let's go to which medication route will deliver the fastest pain relief? Very good, IV, IV will be the fastest. Okay, are we all ready for our last question? This is gonna, oh, Anna R broke in. Uh, so I think J, JW as well into the top five. So here it is, last question. Who is the best authority on the nature of a patient's pain? Excellent. It is the patient themselves. We need to listen to um, and uh, really pay attention to what our patients are telling us. All right. So let's see who got gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, congratulations to Xavier. Uh, dominated from the top. So uh, uh, Kirsten and then Ryan. So great job there, everyone. Uh, let's hear it for everybody. All right. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague who is an incredible expert on pain. Uh, Don, take it away. We currently cannot hear you. <laughs> I'm just not used to having to hold it, so, you know, you might have to cue me a couple of times. Uh, so, can I just mention, Don, there is a little thing that you can hook it on your uh, neckline if you want. Oh, that would, let's see. Oh, excellent. I think... Not having me in charge of holding something. I worked here two years before I realized that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to put up Twin Cities so I can see them up on the screen for me? And then, um, so Pain Awareness Month happens to be in September. How many of you wore blue? I see a couple. How about out there in the cities? I can't see any of you, but I'm sure you did. Um, so this International Association of the Study of Pain um, is a really good website if you're looking at things that have to do with pain. Um, anyway, blue is the color for pain awareness, so I thought I would let you know since it really was September, and you could do that. So today we're going to talk a little bit about pain and spirituality. Why do we even care, right? So there's pain. We're going to give them whatever drug the doctor said. It's in the orders, right? So pain in America, you can see there 116 million over there on the East Coast and then kind of broadening out. More people live with chronic pain than with cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. 
Um, more than 30% of Americans are living with some form of chronic or severe pain. So it's a big deal. And this summer when I was doing clinicals, I worked on a pain management team, uh, which was run by a CNS. And inter uh, did you guys watch your voice threads and, and YouTube video? Um, it, it wasn't the same lady, but I worked with a lady who had the same position as her, so she worked on a pain team. Um, and it was interesting, in the hospital, her job was to treat pain patients with pain, and most of her patients were uh, patients who had chronic pain who came into the hospital and now had acute. So acute on chronic pain, which is very difficult to, uh, to manage because Again, you have things going on from both sides. So you have to treat definitely very multimodal. Um, so in Twin Cities, I'm seeing a wonderful another picture. I have two pictures of, uh, of my PowerPoint. I'd really love to see some students if I could. That would be awesome. So anyway, when we talk about guiding principles of pain uh, management, uh, in the ANA Code of Ethics, nurses are ethically and legally responsible for managing pain and relieving suffering. Um, the American Pain Foundation, pain relief is a basic human right. And then, as Rainey mentioned, the American Bar Association has said that pain relief is a basic legal right. So patients coming into the hospital often receive a pamphlet that has the patient's bill of rights, and pain control is in that document. So the prevalence of uh, chronic pain in the United States, it's one of the most common reasons that adults seek medical care. Um, it has been linked to restrictions in mobility and daily activities. And what do we know? If you don't use it, you lose it, okay? So as these people go up in pain and they quit doing things, it uh, starts to limit them, they don't want to get up, um, all of a sudden they're not up ever again, okay? There becomes a dependence on opioids. Have we seen the opioid crisis happening? Um, we're getting a little teeny handle on it, the very corner um, of something that's gone kind of wild. Um, anxiety and depression, so particularly chronic pain, um, leads to depression and anxiety because you, you are always kind of in that state of fight or flight, okay? Your sympathetic nervous system is just chugging away trying to figure out why am I in pain, why am I in pain, I gotta run, I gotta run. And so you really need to do things um, not just pharmacologically but non-pharmacologically to get that parasympathetic nervous system to kick in because it won't on its own when you're uh, in pain all the time. Poor perceived health or reduced quality of life um, and sometimes it's not just perceived, it really is a poor uh, quality of life. And the population-based uh, estimates of chronic pain among U.S. adults ranges from 11 to 40 percent. So when you think, if I had you all do what the exercise I did when you were older, you know, think about how many people in this room would stand up. So I'm going to confess to you I'm a chronic pain patient, right? I don't know that any of you would ever know that, okay? Um, but there's lots of days that I have kind of bad days. Again, you're not going to know it. So be careful how you judge people, okay? Just because I'm not bleeding from my eyes or my foot or my arm does not mean that I'm not in pain. So patients really are the best, um, uh, the best person to ask about their own pain, okay? It's very important. Pain in the elderly, so if we go specifically to that population, it was higher, actually. Um, there was a study released in 2011 that had um, 40 to 80 percent of older adults suffering from chronic pain. Um, in the IASP that I looked at for 2018, it says about 20 percent of older adults suffer from chronic pain. Now, you know, again, we have those Germans and Norwegians, of which my husband is one, and he's always fine. He's fine. He, he put a rake through the top of his head and almost poked his eye out. Um, went into the hospital to have stitches there, and he was fine. Yeah, he, di he didn't need any, you know, anesthetic or anything. He's fine. Okay. So um, age-related uh, psychosocial phenomena, such as the loss of family, friends, sometimes even children, 
um, and the loss of independence, things that they're used to, maybe retiring, um, can contribute to pain and suffering. So in other words, there's no distraction. There's less joy to kind of filter in, okay? Sensitivity to pain uh, may be reduced in older adults. That does not mean that those people experience less pain, okay? Um, symptoms such as depression and anxiety, sleep disturbances, weight loss, cognitive impairment, all of those things can kind of manifest um, when pain is high, okay? Um, and so we have to treat the pain, and that will alleviate some of those outlying symptoms that come from that. So the definition of pain um, comes from your, I believe it's your foundations book or the Lewis book. Anyway, um, it's a complex, multidimensional experience that can cause suffering and decreased quality of life. There's lots of definitions out there. So the IASP says it's an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. I like that part. Associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So you can see that kind of depending on where you're looking, but there are kind of themes, kind of crossover, right? It's an unpleasant problem, okay? So let's do this little activity here. Grace is 69 years old, and she had a total knee replacement yesterday, okay? She has a history of arthritis in her hands and knees. Um, that's one of the reasons she's getting a knee replacement. Uh, Grace is sitting on her bed, smiling and chatting with her granddaughter, Hannah. And as she looks at Hannah's drawings, the RN asks you to assess vital signs and pain intensity. So well, Grace's vital signs are all within normal limits. She reports a pain score of 7 out of 10. And after leaving the room, you document her vital signs and her pain score. And the RN says to you that pain score can't be right. Didn't you see her smiling and chatting? Besides, her vital signs are all normal. So discuss this in your groups. You can maybe take some notes on your whiteboard. Let's see if we have any common themes or threads. Think about, should you believe the patient's report? Why or why not? Okay. Identify possible reasons that Grace might not present in a more pained or expressive manner. There's lots of reasons. How do, you, how do you, as a student nurse, respond to your nurse? I will tell you that my students have had to talk to doctors and advocate for pain um, medication and different things for their patients. Uh, Grace has an order for a PRN, which is as needed uh, pain medication, should you offer it to her, okay? And identify additional nursing interventions you could offer to help Grace's pain. And I'm going to give you uh, four or five minutes to do that. Could I ask everybody decide who's going to be your recorder and uh, start writing down on to that whiteboard uh, number it, numbers? It helps Don and I as we circulate to give you feedback. Okay, so when we break into these kinds of activities, our job is to kind of wander around. A, make sure they're actually visiting about what we want them to, writing down things. If we see them kind of going off in a kind of a Kind of bring them back.
Okay, everybody, let's think about kind of wrapping it up, minute and a half or so. Okay, Sam. All right. So let's start um, maybe in the cities. Let's see what uh, some of those groups have thought about. Um, Olivia, pick a, pick a friend in your group, and why don't you give us um, what you think about the patient's report. Um, and although you can answer that with a yes or no, I'm asking you to expound upon some reasons. All right, Olivia, what does you and your partner say? Okay, for number one, we said yes, you should believe the pain. Um, they could be, like, trying to act, like, normal in front of the granddaughter, and not trying to, like, show, or, like, um, like, she's in a lot of pain, she might be trying to hide it, and not, like, make the granddaughter, like, worried. Can everyone hear that? In, okay. Speak a little louder. You're sharing great stuff. Sorry, I'm a little sick right now. So, okay. so we just said yes, believe the patient. She could be trying to like act normal and like kind of try to hide the pain in front of her granddaughter so she wouldn't be like the granddaughter wouldn't be worried. So we're saying she's really trying to be protective of her granddaughter is probably one of the things that's going on. Good. 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 Excellent. So how about uh, here actually in Rochester? Anybody have anything different? Yeah. Can we turn on the overhead mics in Rochester? Act like a nuisance or anything to the nurses if she feels like she ah, like doesn't want to be a nuisance yeah. for the nurses. And then mm. um, it also depends like on her pain tolerance if she just wants to hide it. Absolutely, pain tolerance. How about anybody else? There's one word that I'm kind of looking for, Brian. I don't know if I have the word, but I was just going to say it. <laughs> pictures she might have a reduced tolerance. Ah, a little distraction from the from the daughter's pictures that isn't what I was looking for but that is magnificent how about in the cities anybody have different things that have already come up kind of rainy alluded to it when we had the cahoot yeah Margaret um, Maggie Kind of legally and ethically. I don't know. I legally and ethically? Absolutely. We, we have to because legally or ethically. What about her culture? Do you think there's certain cultures that are more stoic than others? Um, you know, my mother-in-law actually died, like Rainey said, being fine. She was fine. When I saw her at midnight, she was fine. And in the morning, um, she'd actually gone into a coma and was dying. So she wasn't really fine, but she was fine. So you will find that not just with Germans and uh, pe people of Swedish descent, however, they are very notorious, um, there are other cultures that are very much the same. And they learn from a very young age that that's just the way they manage it. Um, there was also a physician in North Dakota. Um, he actually had kidney stones, which for a, I worked in the emergency room, and for a man, let's just say that is incredibly painful. Painful for women, too, but, man, I've seen men cry like babies. Um, and he sat in his bed, and he did... Um, relaxation breathing and he was doing something else it's been a long time I can't remember and you would have never known on his face he never moaned he never groaned he never moved in his bed I kept asking him if he needed anything for pain uh, yeah no he didn't so um, we do need to believe them we want them to share that information with us and although things might not look like they're adding up um, again remember you can't see inside someone all right good so how might you respond to the nurse? 
So you're a student nurse, you're responding to somebody who's maybe had more time on the floor, um, maybe feels a little more superior, maybe even who's worked in ER where we got a lot of patients who were drug seekers, okay, so she might be a little hard. Any ideas? Uh, let's start in the cities. Um, let's start with about... Margaret and Milan. It, or okay. Milan or Milan? Milan. Mylan. So, Margaret and Mylan, what did you guys come up with? Speak uh, speak for the microphones in the ceiling. Me? Um, okay, so we said every patient has a different pain scale, so it's individualized. So, like, just because um, maybe to the nurse that wouldn't be a 7 to her, that doesn't mean that to Grace it's not a pain level of 7. Um, and then we also said that the vital signs are not always indicative of pain, and because she... Grace is experiencing a chronic illness. Her, she, her like vital signs could adjust to that and always be that way, even though she's still in pain the entire time. Excellent. Okay, good. Anybody here? Yeah. Mm hmm. Is it we can't hear Perfect. anything? Uh, do you have the overhead mics on? So Abigail shared that she just had a uh, knee replacement yesterday, but she's been dealing with arthritis her whole life. So she's been in pain her whole life. So maybe it's not that much different um, than what she's always had and learned to deal with. Ryan? Yeah, we talked about how pain is subjective to the patient, and so they're the expert of what they feel, so we can trust what they say is what's going on. So here's the most important question. I'll let you guys in Twin Cities take this. Um, are you going to feel comfortable talking to a nurse or a physician advocating for your patient with regards to pain? What do you think? Yes or no? Morgan, Ella, why don't you take this one? Well, we said yes, we would, because, like, everyone's kind of sad if we can echo that she's the only one who knows her real true pain level, and she has, like, she can say no, but it's, like, she could be off with pain medication. If she wasn't comfortable with that, then there's other integrative therapy, like, Good. mechanisms, yeah. I like Good. that you're pulling in the non-pharmacological. Sure. How about here in Rochester? What's your, what are your thoughts? Are you going to feel comfortable? speaking to the nurse. Now I would say one thing that I heard while everybody was telling me why, how would you respond to the nurse. You're using evidence-based practice. This is all not just what Rainy and I are making up today or how I feel. This actually is documented, researched, studied out, okay? So everything that we're talking about today has a plethora of research surrounding it. So as long as when you're saying your case to the nurse, that you stay within those boundaries of that which you can prove, it's not just you're on your soapbox for this nice little lady, right? You're talking about something that's been researched, okay? That is really a safe way. And go in with humility and, you know, don't go in like guns a-blazing, um, but start sharing some of that evidence-based information. Okay. What do you think about the PRN medication here in Rochester? Yes? No? Yeah? I think it's worth um, looking into for sure when she last had it, those kinds of things. And there in Twin Cities, what additional nursing interventions do you think might help? Lauren and Robert, what did you think of? Um... We said we could look for some more holistic, uh, holistic approaches, such as like aromatherapies or acupuncture or something that could uh, help with her arthritis, other than pharma like pharmaceutical options. Okay. I, I will tell you here in the Twin Cities, at Northwestern, there is an acupuncturist that um, some units where we did clinical, where it was part of the uh, morning rounds. Yeah, and at Woodbury it is as well. They can have that. Um, and really think about what is she responding to already. She's responding to family. She's responding to distraction. So think about those things that you can see that are already working and kind of play off of those things, right? So good job, you guys. Great job. Okay. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Am I going backwards? I think I might be. Okay. Oh, what's going on here? Did I put it in twice? 
Okay, here we go. That's what we did. So definitions continued. Pain is whatever the person experiencing it says it is. Acute pain is pain that diminishes over time, particularly as we would expect healing to occur. Okay? Um, now, some things take longer to heal. Some things take shorter amounts of time to heal. So knowing the pathophysiology of whatever problem you're dealing with, that's kind of what you kind of put in there. Chronic pain lasts for longer than three months or past the time when expected acute pain or acute injury should heal. So I want to use an example of a burn patient. A patient who's had burns over 60, 70% of their body um, may not be quite healed in three months, okay? Um, so you do have to think about what's going on. Please see table 8-4 in your Lewis test book on page 107. I would use that when I was studying. Um, I think that it will help you a great deal. So, uh, Rainey talked in the beginning um, when we were doing the Kahoot about common misconceptions, and they are out there. Nurses are the best authority of the nature of a pa uh, patient's pain because, you know, they've seen so many of them. You know, they should, they can just look at you and they can tell how much pain you're in, right? Chronic pain is psychological, not physical, okay? Um, so for myself, if we had a nice MRI up of my back, um, you guys would see several abnormalities. So uh, definitely not all in my head. There is a physical component for sure. However, I will say that um, when pain is really high for a very long time, remember that anxiety, depression, things like that, it kind of all becomes hard to unthread. Receiving analgesics on a regular basis will lead to addiction, particularly opioids. So, you know, if we have someone who um, has a chronic disease that's very, very painful, like rheumatoid arthritis, and they take medication with opioids in it over time, a long period of time, they're going to become addicted. Not true. They may become tolerant, okay? And so the amounts that they have been taking probably are not going to be suitable. After five years, we may have to up the dose or change the medication because the body gets used to that, okay? Um, so when you're, and I have had lots of older people who tell me, I don't want to, I don't want to take that. I don't want to get addicted. So that happens a lot. You need to be able to respond, again, with evidence-based practice. There's no research that supports that if you take these medications, you're going to become addicted. Okay? If they have a true physiological need for that, they probably are not going to. Okay? Clients with dementia don't feel pain. You know, they're confused, so they don't feel pain. They feel pain just like you and I do. Okay? Um, so it is, dementia is a brain problem. Unfortunately, it doesn't actually attack that part of the brain. Um, what it does do is cause patients with dementia or delirium to act out in ways that they normally don't. So that's one of the ways that we can tell that there's pain going on is that their normal baseline is not the same anymore, okay? Uh, pain is a natural outcome of growing old, and I would say no, no, no. And most of you who did your interviews, I've been reading them. They're amazing. And you can see that there are plenty of people out there that aren't experiencing pain that are go, go, going, um, and they're doing really fine. So um, although their body goes through some degeneration, like the back and some of the joints and things like that, um, pain is not a natural outcome of growing old in and of itself. Um, so this is just that table. I want you to look at what acute pain is, chronic pain. I want you to look at the differences because this might be something that's on the exam where you're looking at that course of pain or the goals of treatment. They might be different. Okay? So this should just be a quick review, and the only reason I'm putting it up here is for you to remember that pain is going through the spinal column, right? It's, it's transferring that information, whether it be chemical in the form of neurotransmitters or electronic, so that it's bumping from neuron to neuron, okay? It's using this as its highway, 
Okay? And so you can take a look at this nice picture in your book, and you can think about we can use drugs or non-pharmacological therapies to intervene in any one of these places. With transduction, right, if I put a lidocaine patch right here, okay, right where the pain is, I can stop that from actually going out to transmission, okay? There are other medications that work within the spinal column. There are other medications that work when it's coming back down, okay? And you'll get more into that in your pharmacology. If you know, though, that pain has all of these different ways, you can choose the right treatment or several treatments, okay, um, that work on all these ways that nociceptive pain is being received by the brain and then sent back to the body. Peripheral pain is kind of, uh, it, it's kind of, uh, hmm, what would I say? It doesn't always follow all of the rules, okay? It can be pain caused by a lesion or disease of the peripheral somatosensory nervous system. And by lesion, I mean that it could even be scar tissue. That's a lesion after it grows out, right? Um, so that's what my pain comes, is from scar tissue that's wrapped around all the kinds of places that it shouldn't be. So it causes neuropathy, and we did that little sensory thing. So neuropathy is a funny thing. It can feel like nothing where you can't feel it at all. And I talked about the diabetic patient that we had the big wound on. You could do his dressings, right, without him even knowing it. And then you can have neuropathy that is so horrific you can't even believe it. So it feels like it's on fire. It feels like somebody's sawing it off. It feels like there are pins and needles. Um, it feels like it's in the freezer and it's freezing off. I mean, it has all these really odd sensations. So everything from being absolutely, totally numb to having wild, crazy, fiery, and it's on and off, and they change all the time, and so you're never really sure what it is you're going to get in the mix that day, okay? So this is, again, now we're looking at a comparison of nociceptive and neuropathic pain. Again, very worth your while to actually look at this in your book. So if a question comes up and you have a patient who has neuropathic pain or nociceptive pain, A, you'll be able to figure it out, and you'll know what to do about it, okay? Could I add one thing quickly, Dawn? Absolutely. Um, if, we, if you just go back one slide. This may seem kind of um, abstract, but you really need to understand if the pain is uh, neuropathic, it really doesn't respond well to opioids. And so you have like, well, I've given them all these tons of opioids. Well, it, that doesn't help neuropathic pain. So we have drugs like Neurontin, um, the, the anti-inflammatories sometimes can help a little bit. This. We have some different adjuncts. Um, but just remember, neuropathic pain doesn't respond well to opioids. So if your patient's not responding to the opioid, it doesn't mean they're an addict. Maybe we're using the wrong drug. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, anti-seizure medications, antidepressants. Um, so you'll have all these kind of off-label or extra things that it works for, and that's what they're using for neuropathic pain. Yeah, it's, it's really tricky because it sometimes it doesn't respond to anything, and so it can be really um, a bugger. Okay, so pain assessment. Pain is considered the fifth vital sign. Um, it has to be accurate in order for you to to decide what appropriate interventions you're going to do for pain, right? Um, in other words, if someone tells you their pain is a 9 out of 10, are you going to have the pet therapist come along or are you going to get their PRN uh, Percocet, okay? So those are the kinds of things. If it's not accurate, you're not going to be able to be making good decisions. A patient's self-report is the single most reliable indicator. We've talked about that a hundred times, so hopefully that will stick. A patient's unable, uh, for patients unable to self-report, behavioral assessment tools are utilized, and there are a few of them in this PowerPoint, which I'll share with you. Um, intensity is only one dimension. So other things that we want to know is where is it, okay? Is it radiating? What's kind of the quality of that? Has what has worked in the past? Super important question a lot of people forget to ask. Because if it's worked in the past, past it's definitely worth a try now, right? Um, and then what's its impact on your life, right? 
So if your pain makes you have to lay in bed for days and days and days, or your pain kind of is irritating, okay? Those are two totally different things with priorities, nursing priorities, medical priorities that are much different, okay? So we want to know what their function is. We want to know all of these kinds of things in order um, to make a good assessment. So this one actually came from your Potter and Perry book. So it's the A, B, C, D, E. Um, so ask. Ask about pain regularly. So what I find often with students is they ask about pain really often, but what they don't ask is after they do an intervention, did it work? Okay? Um, and not just students, I must say. Sometimes nurses don't either. There's little flags on your computer that say, did you go reassess? So reassess, reassess. Um, so no matter what you do, okay, if you give her a coloring book to, to do, if you give a medication, if you do a therapeutic touch or Reiki or deep breathing, the most important thing is, did it work? So if you don't reassess, you just keep chasing the same tail, right? And you have no idea what's working, what's not working, what you could try, um, and those kinds of things. So ask regularly and then particularly reassess after you've done something, okay? Believe the patient. Choose the pain control appropriate, and we've talked a little bit about that already. Deliver interventions in a timely, logical, and coordinated way. I will tell you, when you have patients who, and, and literally patients who have acute pain, like particularly from surgery and things, and it's written up on their little whiteboard, you are able to receive your pain medications at 11 a.m., man, it's starting to wear off. And 10.50, man, they're counting down. And about 10.55, they're going to push their button, okay? And let me tell you what, by 11.01, they are expecting you to be around somewhere, okay? And particularly first and second day post-op, those patients are in horrendous amounts of pain. Plus, they're doing PT. I mean, they're trying to get their function back. We want them to be able to work with PT. So if we don't give them their pain medications, they can't give them their all, right? And so it's super important Never say, I'll be, I'll be right back with that and then get distracted, okay? Because, again, it's about trust, okay? Um, yeah, it's just, I could go into a story that, actually, I'm going to go into a story. So I had students at the U on uh, Tuesday, and we were on a floor where we get a lot of spinal patients. And um, they were doing report, actually, with my students, and, of course, the lights are going off because all the nurses are off the floor giving reports, so I start answering lights. And there was a woman who had, uh, was first day post spinal and she had a horrendous migraine and of course, and she even had a PCA pump. Um, she was in a lot of pain, but it was her migraine that was giving her the most trouble. Me being a migraine sufferer, I'm like, hey, I'll tell you what, I'm going to run and get you some ice. And she kind of gave me the look like, you've got to be kidding me. And so I went and I got two bags of ice. I came back in. I put one in the back of her head, one in the front of her head. I stood there holding her hand for like two seconds. She was out like a light bulb. Okay? When she woke up about three hours later, she kept saying, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Okay? So even the littlest thing that you can do to, you know, it wasn't time for her medication, but she was in pain, right? So... Ice, and I will tell you, my students probably went through 40 bags of ice that day. All of them had spinal patients, and ice, they would walk in here and tell you, magic, magic. So um, don't ever think those little things are little things. They're big things to your patients. Um, and then empower patients to control their own pain. So by um, empowering, a lot of it's education. Okay, so now that woman knows that her migraines can be controlled with ice, right? So, you know, letting her know that those migraines are caused by blood vessels in the brain, right? And they respond very well to ice, okay? So, again, knowing the pathophysiology, empowering them with education, right? Um, exercise, although you would think exercise would be counterintuitive for pain, Many times what we call is it's getting up and greasing the wheels, right? You need to get those knees moving. You need to get moving a little bit, even though those first steps are really hard, and then you're going to start to feel better, okay? So empowering your patients, not just with pills, 
but with education about how to manage their pain, okay? Uh, potential errors in pain assessment, bias, okay? Unfortunately, as much as we teach new students going out, that it's the patient that is going to tell you what your pain is, we still have internal bias, okay? Recognize it. Say to yourself, no, I am not going to go there. I am going to believe this patient. I don't care if she's doing a tap dance down the hall. If she says her pain is a nine, it's going to be a nine, okay? Because that, that bias just sneaks up at us. Or for me in ER, it was really hard, and I had to go round and round with a couple of docs different times when we had drug-seeking patients who actually ended up in the ER for real things, um, and then the docs didn't want to give them meds. Um, or even treat them, actually, while they were in there. So um, remember, don't let bias, and it doesn't matter. Bias is across, across lots and lots of different things, but here it can really be dangerous. Vague questions asked by the nurse. How are you? <laughs> okay, that's what you're going to get. Good, fine. Yep, good, fine. So how's the pain today? Okay, okay, okay. where is it, right? So start asking some questions. Were you able to sleep last night, right? So if you don't ask a good question, you are not going to get a good answer, okay? Um, so don't just pick one of the ten questions you could ask and think that's good enough, like how'd you sleep last night? If they slept, that's great. They don't have any pain, okay? You need to ask lots of questions because a lot of times it isn't even cultural that they don't volunteer. They're sick, they're tired, and they want to sleep. So if they give you one little piece of information, they want you to go away, okay? And so asking those really good questions. Um, use of medical terms or jargon. So you don't need to use all your pathophysiology words. You don't need to use all of your medical words. Use language that they're going to understand, okay? And that goes across any kind of education, right? Um, we know that uh, medical illiteracy is is huge, okay? And so it also is if you talk in those kinds of languages, whoo, a lot of times doctors will come in, talk to their patients, and leave, and immediately the patient says to the nurse, what did he just say? Like, how often is that? All the time. And so I try to be around when my docs go in the room because... Patients don't know what they're saying. They're using all kinds of medical language. They shorten everything up to about five or six words because they've got a lot of patients on their service. And when you ask, do you have any questions, every patient, that's a vague question too. Do you have any questions? Nope, I'm fine. So away they go. So, um, and cognitively impaired patients are difficult to deal with um, because there's so many layers of things going on. But we don't not treat them, Okay. So pain assessments, this is a few different kinds of pain assessments. So we have numerical rating scales. So like uh, zero being none and 10 being the worst, what's your pain today? Now there is some value in that, particularly for a reassessment, right? In other words, that's going to tell you did a 7 turn into a 5 or, or did a 5 turn into a 10, right? So it's nice and short and sweet. But how much information is that giving you about returning the patient to function, right? Getting them closer to their baseline. Um, you know, it misses out on a lot of nuances, okay? Um, there are also visual scales that um, we can use with patients who are cognitively impaired or small children. Um, faces is one. Another one is sometimes they'll combine faces with um, colors, and you can see that blue is nice and cool, kind of calming, and red, fiery hot, is out at the end. And I would tell you probably when I was looking for slides for this, I probably saw 100 different pain assessment tools. Your hospital will choose one, and that's what they will use. So the VA where I go, they use Wilda. So, um, and Kappa is the one at the uh, University of Minnesota. And I'm going to tell you this one, I really appreciate, okay? This one you cannot score by a number. If you put in a number, you will get a phone call from the people, the people up above, okay? What they want to know is comfort. How are you feeling? Are you comfortable? And you're looking for answers like intolerable, tolerable, 
comfortably manageable or negligible pain. Now, you have to, you're not going to give them those to pick from. You're having a conversation. So tell me about your pain. I was able to get up and walk all the way to the nurse's station. How did that feel? Man, I just had a little bit of pain, but it was manageable. Okay, so I already know which answer I'm going to get. Okay? Um, change in pain. So after that walk, did it feel better? Did it feel worse? Or was it the same? Okay? This gives you so much more information than a 1 or a 10. Okay? Uh, pain control. Is what we're doing working, right? Do you feel like you need more? Is it, is, is, do you feel like it's too much? I've had patients tell me, oh, my God, don't bring me another one of those opioids. I, I feel so dizzy and crazy after I take them. I just want a Tylenol, okay? Um, functioning. So were you able to get out of bed today? Were you, how far were you able to walk? Yesterday you walked to the nurse's station. Did you make it down to the, to the doors today, or were you more sore? Okay, so you're having a conversation. I'll tell you, you can grab so much information from a conversation, more information than I'm a two today, right? It just doesn't, it's valuable in its own way, but this is so much better. And then sleep, okay? Even on that first day post-surgical when they're sleeping on and off, on and off, let me tell you what, your patients are really much more happier if they've slept pretty much all day, okay? I slept all day. Because if a first or second day post-surgical isn't sleeping at all, this is a very bad thing. Their body is not healing, okay? Not only are they not getting any sleep, they're just not healing, okay? So we need to put them in their best so that they can heal. They're not able to work with physical therapists. They're not able to do pretty much anything, all right? Um, and then there are... Um, like I said, the categorical scales would be uh, an example of the kappa. So there's different tools for different things. So if you had a test question and it explained a certain kind of patient, you should be able to decide which kind of tool and have a rationale that, that you would want to use, right? If you're doing a reassessment, maybe a 0 to 10 is fine, okay? If you're doing an initial, right, maybe you want to use a kappa. Your patient is cognitive. So they're able to talk with you. If you don't have a cognitive patient, then you can't do that. Yeah? How do you score this then? Or do you, know you just, this? in the computer, you literally pick tolerable, intolerable, comfortably manageable, or negligible pain. So you are using their conversation to determine one of those answers, and you check that box. Okay? And then if you have more information, you narrative chart it. Good question. So there are no numbers. But it's, it's, it's a question so in the Twin Cities. Yeah. Um, they, tell, they say that you have to use the same scale that you use the original assessment with for the pain. Um, is that still true or because we can kind of gauge how they're feeling based on what they tell us, like neg negligible or whatever, does that not matter to use another different scale? It's better to use the same scale all the time. Now, the reassessments with the Kappa tool, I think they're only using three. I want to say change in pain, pain control, and function. I could be wrong, but I think at the U, those are the three they're using when they reassess. Um, I would say if you can use the same one all the time, that's, that's a better way to go about it. And at the University of Minnesota, there is nowhere to put in a number. So if you ask them 0 to 10, which might be part of your conversation, it isn't that you can't use that as part of your conversation, right? But you need to ask more questions so you can put it in this scale. You're never going to put a 0, you're never going to put a 10, a 5, a 7. But if they tell you, you know, it's because they're every, every other hospital is using numbers usually, right? So I was a 7 and now I'm a 5. Whoo! It, let's see, there's one here that says partially effective, right? So you're able, and then you ask more questions. That's a great question in the cities. Thank you very much. Anybody else have questions? Okie dokie. So the goal of pain management everywhere all the time is to increase optimal function. So the funny thing is, it should say to reduce pain, right? But really, it's to increase function, because that is getting rid of the pain, right? 
in some sense, like, my pain's never going to go away. So if you want to make it go away for me to be better, well, then that's going to be a long time coming, right? But increase optimal function? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay? I, I can pretty much do what I want to do, and then I have to make some decisions about how much pain I want to be in, but um, increase optimal function. Okay? Can I one thing you Yep. Uh, <laughs> I would underline that word function. It's so important because somebody could say, well, my pain's a three if I lay in bed all the time and I never move. So it can be a two or a three. Well, that's not how people want to live. And so um, I think that's really important is are you able to live your life? Because if you were to talk to Dawn, if you were to talk to Abigail, um, who both of whom are living with chronic pain, they'll tell you zero is probably not on the table. But are they able to live their lives to the fullest? Absolutely. Thank you, Rainey. That's awesome. And then in that same token, you need to help your patients develop realistic expectations. When I had my first back surgery, I was a nurse. I seriously thought I was going to get fixed. Wow. You know, because it's everybody else, right? So he told me there's a 50% chance you're going to get better, 50% chance you're going to get worse, or no. 50% chance you're going to get better. I did not realize that the other 50% get worse. I thought everybody else just stayed the same. So when I didn't come out where I thought I was, that was super hard to deal with. And um, I went through a chronic man pain management, and that was their focus, was helping you have realistic expectations. It helps you be in control of your pain. You're probably never going to be a zero, you're probably never going to be a one. But what can you do at a four, and how can you stay at a four, right? So it's really helping your patients develop. Now, if it's acute pain, what would be a realistic expectation? They should go back to baseline, right? If they didn't have any chronic pain before, they should go right back to zero. But if you have a patient who has had chronic pain and you're treating it with def lots of different things, their realistic goal is to give them the tools to help understand where their pain is going to be and give them tools that they can help decide where that will be. Um, and then teamwork and collaboration. We already talked about pain teams. If you're a nurse um, that wants to go into grad school and you want to go into nurse practitioner or a clinical nurse specialist, a lot of them are in charge and run those pain teams. They're incredibly important. I think they are probably the way of the future. Um, I've worked in two hospitals where they have pain teams. That doesn't mean I've been all over the cities. Um, but if you have a chance when you're out in your clinicals and you run into the people from the pain teams, have some conversations with them. It's a it's an awesome job. It's, I mean, I would do it in a heartbeat. Okay? So when you need more uh, help when you don't know what to do, when everything else fails, okay, or you can call that team, or a lot of times the physicians automatically, so the pain team was rounding on all of our spinal patients when we were up on the, on the floor, so they automatically put them in as a consult for these people, okay? Now, if they come in and they don't need anything, that's great, they're signed off, but some of these people are going to need more care because they had acute now on top of chronic pain, which is complex, okay? So pain management therapies, you know, I have a lot of them up here, and this definitely, absolutely is not complete, okay? Now, medication is an important part of pain management, and don't ever think you need to withhold pain, man uh, pain medication um, for any reason other than it's not time yet. Okay, or if you have or you've seen something that makes you concerned. Um, but remember, medication, you are a dependent provider. You're dependent on the physician for making that decision, right? He has to write you a script for Percocet. Guess what? I ran and got that ice all by myself, and I got rid of her migraine all by myself. She kept saying, I need my Maltex. I need it. I need it. I'm like, okay. You know, they'll probably bring it with your morning meds, put the ice packs on, and off it went, okay? You are an independent provider distraction. You don't need to ask for a doctor's order for a distraction. Heat, another thing. Now, sometimes it is contraindicated, so I will tell you, you have to be careful, more careful with heat than ice. 
relaxation, uh, massage. You can sit and do a hand massage with patients. All of these things you can do independently, okay? You have control over like that whole list where doctors can prescribe a pill. And a lot of times the pills are going to run out at home. So giving them power and giving them tools and education about how to receive pain control in other ways is important. Can you think of any others that aren't up there? Or you're surprised to see any of those up there? Hmm? Spiritual, absolute prayer. Is prayer up there? It's not up there. Prayer, amazing, absolutely. Good catch. Anybody else? Um, yes, yeah, you're in the Twin Cities. Jasmine would like to add something. Um, you could Jasmine. offer like repositioning. Frequent repositioning, absolutely. We had a patient on Tuesday. That's what we we did. Ice and repositioning for her all day long. Perfect. So really thinking about and using what you got in your toolbox, your two hands and your brain, and whatever's around you. A couple of pillows, prop somebody up. You'd be amazed. So key points here, it's important for older adults not, uh, it's, it's common for older adults not to report pain. Sometimes it's cultural, sometimes it's stoic, sometimes they do not want to cause, somebody talked here in uh, Rochester about them not wanting to be a problem. We do, we do see that where they don't, they, they just don't want to be a problem to anybody. And doctors, you know, are as close to God as you could possibly get. They know everything and, you know, they should, they should have gotten better. If they didn't get better, it's all their fault they didn't. So they're not going to say anything. Patients with chronic pain rarely show behavioral changes. Patients with chronic pain have vital signs that are within normal limits. Cultural influences um, affect the expression of pain. And addiction rarely occurs with patients who are prescribed opiates who take them appropriately and need them. Okay? So... I am going to give you guys, let me see on my watch, I'm going to give you guys just 10 because um, you'll get another quick one probably between the next two speakers, okay? So, run fast like Ninja, get something to drink, go potty. Um, those we can, uh, I suppose we should wait and see who has a computer.
<laughs> Can you unmute me just for a second? Hey, Rainy. Hey, how are you? Um, we're going to go into that uh, assessment piece first. So um, I actually printed some out for students who didn't have computers. We have it here, too. I don't too. know if you did the same. Okay, did. good. Okay. Well, then we'll get back together here in a couple of minutes. Just uh, let them know that the uh, PowerPoint for the last hour in Rochester, um, it is now posted, so they can download that if they wish. Okay. So for uh, in Twin Cities, hello, back again. So we can hear you. Good. Um, so some people downloaded the PowerPoints before um, I changed things up and found a whole section on um, marijuana and CBD use. Now that was never intended to be tested information anyway, but I was going to add it to this lecture to briefly go over. Um, however, it screwed my entire PowerPoint up to like craziness. So I had to go back to the first version. So for those of you who printed it, um, and you can see what's on there, great. But Rainey will be covering that again um, when he does addiction. So don't feel like you're missing something or you don't have it. Um, are you raising your hand over here? Oh, for her, okay. Um, and so, like I said, it's all the same information except those additional 12 or 13 slides. And we'll make sure that you get those um, during the addiction part. Um, uh, John, can I add one quick thing? Um, yep. The study guide for the exam will be posted later this evening. Um, so we will have on there, there's always two pages. Um, so the second page has some tips on how to study for this exam. We choose to have this first exam only 30 questions. From then on, it's, it's larger tests. But um, I just wanted to um, make you aware that that will be posted this evening. And, um, and then also we'll be talking about mar medical marijuana and CBD oil um, in the uh, December. So okay. thank you. Yeah. Um, and then Rainey did also say, some of you weren't in the room yet, that um, the lecture PowerPoint for the last hour is already up on Canvas. You don't need it right now, um, but never to fear. We're ready for you. So we haven't been doing such a bad job. Okay. So... First up comes an activity. So you've got two assessments. Um, there is the uh, FICA spiritual assessment and the HOPE assessment. I'd like for you to take some time individually to fill out both of those, um, and then we'll have a conversation about that. So if you can do that in like four and a half minutes, that would be just super duper. Did we need them? Um, you can go in and have uh, Kelly print out. Yeah. Anybody else need a copy there?
sending these in, so you're just sharing with yourself.
okay just another minute or so and if you haven't got it totally completed hopefully you can kind of see there are some subtle differences between them again you're not going to be handing this in to us or anything like that or showing anybody your answers I just wanted you to get a, an opportunity to really think about how you would answer those so when you were posing them to a patient you would think what's kind of going through their head when they are actually answering them so when your table is finished I want you to break up into your smaller groups so your tables of five will be three and two your tables of six will be three and three and in your smaller groups kind of talk about um, compare and contrast those two specifically you know what was kind of the same what was different did you like one over the other you know so compare and contrast um, and you can write those on a piece of paper or your whiteboard at some point you're going to transfer everything to your whiteboard so it doesn't matter to me when you do it um, and we'll let you talk for about yeah three four minutes and then we'll get into your larger groups After you're done in your groups of three, you can automatically move into your groups of six, and I'll just watch for those conversations to finish. Um, be sure to write on your whiteboards what your kind of major themes were for compare and contrast, um, and I'll let you do it.
Dawn, we're ready to come back together when you are. Okay. So you all know this is Lily, your TA, right? So I just erased her name, that's why. like what I saw one group do. Let me see if I can build it. You guys might have to come build it because I'm not always super like one of the folding box people. Uh, they both have. So this is kind of where they cross over. Nice. I don't know if I did it right, but anyway. Oh, blue, purple. Sam, you want to unmute me if I didn't? Okay. So, everybody done? So, um, I'd like for the students in the cities to go up to the board there and write on the board um, some unique things or some compare and contrast of the FICA and the HOPE and then things maybe that they have in common and then we'll have a conversation. So. Each group can go up, one person from each group can go up and write some things. We'll be a bunch of mad dogs at a meat house now. Um. Alexis, could you come out and help me? Um mute one of the projectors. How's everybody doing in uh, Twin Cities? Did we get all done? Rainy must be like, no. 
Am I unmuted? Hey, Rainy, how are we doing in there? He must have just decided he doesn't want to talk to me. How are we doing, Rainy? We're ready to go when you are. Okay, I am. Okay. So first of all, overall, um, what did you think about the spiritual assessments? Do you think they assessed what you would want to know about someone's spirituality if they were in the hospital? Just kind of by a show of hands, yes, no? So do you okay. feel like the, these two tools in general would assess um, spirituality effectively? Raise your hand if you feel yes. Keep your hand down if you feel no. Okay. Kind of the majority up here, Dawn, are feeling yes. Okay. Well, let's look at the FICA kind of first. So here in Rochester, we talked about the FICA is more straightforward. That was one of the things that came out. Um, and this uh, group felt like it was maybe more religion-centered. What kinds of things do you have there under yours? Can you, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, we felt the FICA was less open-ended, more closed-ended, but it leads the patient to answer. Uh, we found that it creates a personal relationship between the patient and nurse. More structured makes it easier to answer. Uh, we found there was more of a yes-no and more of a structure to it. Um, some don't know the difference between religion and spirituality, so that was a conversation that came up in the group talking about themselves and also with the patient. Uh, it okay. found that it was focused more on how spirituality and religion Im uh, impacts the patient's health. Okay. All right. Here in the Rochester, we have hope. So the questions are broad. More broad. They feel a little bit more open-ended. Um, repetitive. So sometimes you can get the same answer for all three questions. More relatable to healthcare and hope-centered. So those were some. Uh, good things. Rainy, what did you have for your hope section? Well, here on hope, we see that um, there's more guidance with the questions, uh, more in-depth, and less religious. Uh, it seems more inclusive, allows for more individuality. Um, we find that it was holistic, more general, reflective of the 21st century culture, uh, helps the form, uh, be, helps us to do more individualized care, more open-ended, which can allow for a variety, wider variety of answers, and um, uh, it can easily lead to conversation and further um, relation, uh, relationship-based care um, and helps us just kind of look into the future. So that's what I would add. Okay, and here they had a kind of a section that had both. So kind of the crossover, so we had the compare and contrast, but then both are patient-specific, both are deep and personal. Um, they both assess well-being, and they both ask what the nurse can do to address spiritual needs. So you can see that they're kind of the same, but they are kind of different. And you may have a preference for one or the other. Um, the reality in the clinical world is your little section on spirituality is going to be small. It's embedded in the epic or I mean, whatever system you use. could be, doesn't matter. Um, and those questions usually um, that are embedded into the EHR are formed by committee. Okay, so it might be a mix of these. It might be whatever. Um, but those are the things that you have to remember as a nurse. You are part of those conversations. Okay, so when you sit on a council or you sit in a committee and you're trying to develop what you want to change or make your EHR give you for information that you want to gather from your patients, think about other assessment tools that you've seen, right? What made one better over the other? Did, was this better? Do you like it more open? Uh, could you sit in a room full of people? I thought there was a nice, healthy, wonderful debate going on over here about one why, one why one person liked one more over the other. And those are the kinds of conversations that you're going to have. So it's important to be able to look at tools and be able to say, A, do they assess the same thing? Is it a little bit different? Do they not even belong in the same, same room? 
Um, and then how do they really affect nurses and patients the best? Maybe we would pick things from one and choose for the other. Do most of you have a, I'll ask here, and in the cities, which of you, if you had a choice between HOPE and FICA, would pick HOPE? Okay. So we have a majority up here for HOPE. Okay, and how about for FICA? Okay. And for? And a, and a minority, yeah, good, good. I did like what someone said about more, uh, about 21st century. Um, that actual tool of the FICA tool was developed in 1996, so it has been a while. And I think the way that we believe and we move around culture and spirituality has evolved. Um, language has evolved. Inclusivity, diversity, all of those kinds of things have uh, evolved. And although I think they both get at the same kinds of things, you know, the language, um, you know, a lot of you are thinking maybe the language of the hope is more what you'd like to see. So I would never throw the baby out with the bathwater when you're in those committees. If there are things from other tools, it's very easy for who's ever building those computers to move things around and bring in things or get rid of old things. So it was kind of just an exercise to get you to think about compare and contrast. One thing that I add, Dawn, is yep. that um, even as a new employee on a unit, you can get on what's called a practice committee, and you can have a real impact. And as a student who's coming out of school, uh, you're really fresh with looking at all the latest research and the latest tools. You may be surprised that even within your first uh, year of nursing, uh, a lot of places it appreciate a fresh set of eyes. So you can get on a practice committee and make a difference in choosing uh, different tools and um, equipment and things like that. Great. Thank you, Rainy. Yeah, that's it's really the truth. So now we'll kind of get into the meat, and this isn't going to take us very long. So spirituality is different than religion. I, I heard a lot of conversation about that. And so spirituality is often defined as an awareness of one's inner self. So when we think about religion, eh, we'll talk about religion in a second. I don't. I, I think of spirituality very different than an awareness of what's happening inside myself or my sense of connection, both with my higher power, people around me, things that are important to me. Okay? It's a very complex, unique to each individual, even unique to each individual, let's say within a religion or a denomination. Okay? So it's super personal. Okay? Um, it's a broader concept than religion, it crosses those boundaries, um, and it also crosses uh, culture and religion. So I have a, a lot of really amazing friends that are from lots of different religions, but there are so many things that we share that are so fabulous. Um, when I was uh, working in the uh, ICU, um, I, uh, I was able to pray with somebody before they went out on a, um, actually here to the city. So they were transferring them out because they were critical. Um, and the family asked me to join in. I was not part of that religion nor that denomination, but I was a spiritual being and they invited me to be a part of their ceremony. Um, I also have been involved in Native American uh, different kinds of activities that they have going on that's more religious that I am not obviously that religion, but my spirit was part of their spirit. Does that kind of make sense? So it's dependent on a person's culture, development, life experiences, beliefs, ideas about life. It, it always isn't able to be boxed into a religion or boxed into any kind of thing. It's very personal. Um, there are some definitions. I would say most definitions are lacking in some way or another, but I did like this one. Um, the word spirituality comes from a Latin word meaning spiritus, which is the breath which gives life to a person. So I think about spirituality as that which gives me life, purpose, meaning. Okay? Um, Nightingale, who was well before her time, wouldn't it be fun to like meet her today? Like I always 
if I could have dinner with one person, like she's she she'd be my pick. Anyway, she believed that spirituality was a force that provided energy needed to promote healthy hospital environments, and that caring for a person's spiritual needs was just as essential as caring for their physical needs. Now, for her to be talking about energy back in the 1880s or 1860s or whenever she wrote this, how crazy is that? I mean, she knew some things she might not have been able to define or to explain or do a research study on. But let me tell you what, she observed a lot of people. And she observed a lot of things in her time. And she knew about energy. She knew about healing environments. So can you think of any barriers that nurses have to assessing and providing spiritual care today? And actually, maybe in the sake of time, we'll just jump into your groups of six for like a minute. Talk together and see if you can think about what kind of, uh, what kind of barriers are there. Intrinsic, so within the person, or extrinsic, in the environment. Are there any barriers to nurses providing spiritual care? Okay, everybody, let's come back together. I know it wasn't a long time to chat. I think you guys could have chatted a really long time about this one. Um, let's think about in the Twin Cities. Is there a group that wants to share? Did you think of any good intrinsic or extrinsic barriers to providing care? How about this group over here? Um, we said that there's a lot more like patients to care for, so there's less time with individual patients time, okay, so that's time, it. time is an extrinsic kind of thing that's very good absolutely anybody else intrinsic in the city all right let's go over here oh I was just gonna say another extrinsic thing is like some hospitals that are private are like you know there are Christian hospitals that are like lean predominantly towards that religion and so like they might do things like daily prayer or things like over the intercom and so if you have patients coming in that don't ascribe to that religion, it could be, like, not weird for them, but, like, it's just, it could impact their care a little bit, feeling like their spiritual needs aren't heard. Okay. And what's some intrinsic? We're looking for intrinsic. I saw a hand here, and then I'll go into Gina. Um, we said some intrinsic variables would be, like, your own unconscious or conscious, like, biases or your own personal beliefs can impact your ability to care for somebody else's beliefs. Excellent. Gina? Absolutely. Um, just like knowledge of their spirituality, like maybe it is religious based, and so like knowledge of that and like making sure you know like what what they follow within that, I guess. Perfect. That's perfect. Good. Okay, let's come back to Rochester here. How about some intrinsic or extrinsic here? What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, 
Yes! Um, did you, were you able to hear that in the city? We couldn't quite hear that. What did you say, Zara? Zara kind of shared that the busyness, just the busy, busy uh, excitement of the hospital doesn't, doesn't really allow for those nice, quiet kind of kind of times. Yeah, back here, Maggie. Um, I was going to say sometimes family members could maybe get in the way of that because if they follow a certain religion. Sure. Family, Other family members. Good. What else? I know at this table I stopped and I dropped a nugget. Come on, Aaron. Oh, uh, space in the room. There you go. Space in the room, extrinsic. So, you know, um, for some families who are um, maybe Somali or Muslim, they like to have a lot of family around. That's very healing, right? Native American families, man, everybody comes. And they stay for a very long time until this patient gets better, right? Well, how big are your hospital rooms? Right? And if you have a double room, you can imagine how crazy that gets. So space is an issue. What else? I also... It's, yeah, Tara. Food restrictions. Or... Food restrictions, those kinds of things. Sure. Anybody else? So I have a... I have a space was one of mine I dropped over here. They didn't know kind of where to go with extrinsic. But another one was environmental where... Um, I had a Native American family come and they were, they were using sage, burning sage. Well, they were doing it in the ICU and the nurses got all worked up because there was a lot of oxygen around and there was a lot of fire. And that made them extremely nervous. Um, and so they kind of put the kibosh to that. Um, I kind of went in and kind of, first of all, there's a big difference between being culturally competent. Do you think that's possible? Could I ever be culturally competent? Could I ever know everything that's in your religion, your spirit, your stuff? Could I? No. I think that word is absolutely ridiculous, although you will find it in research a lot. How about being culturally sensitive? I think we could all be that. So I went in with this Native American family, and I'm just like, you know, I, this is why they don't want you to burn the sage. It's because of the oxygen, and there could be potential explosions. But what else could we do? You know, what else could we do? And so they went and they got Native American blankets, and actually they had a singing ceremony. And that was, it was loud, but it was, it was, it was, it was oh, you guys, it was just amazing. It was amazing to, and I, I, I just asked if I could be a part of it. So you don't have to be an absolute um, expert at everybody's religion. And some people don't want you to be a part of whatever ceremonies they're having, but if they do, join with them. All you're doing is agreeing in that spiritual realm that you want healing to come. So be open to asking questions. Do not get offended when someone does not want you to be a part. But as far as care, all you gotta do is ask the question, right? And be open to the answer, all right? So uh, clinical practice guidelines for quality uh, palliative care. There was some good stuff in there. Spirituality is recognized as a fundamental aspect of compassionate patient and family-centered care. You really cannot thread out a human being and only treat them mentally and physically, right? Because th their whole body is made up of mind, spirit, and body, right? You can't just thread that out. And so somehow you have to be able to provide for them to be cared for spiritually or you have to provide that. <laughs> it's dynamic. It's intrinsic. It's an aspect of humanity. No matter what, we're all human in this room. We all believe different things, but we all have some great things in common, okay? Um I believe that we are seeking ultimate meaning, purpose, transcendence. Um, we have relationships to self, right? Uh, family, others, community, higher powers, whatever brings you strength and peace, okay? Um, a lot of times spirituality is expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices that only that one word is where religion or Den a denomination, religion lives. One word in that whole sentence. Okay? Um, reference to spiritual care uh, also refers to religious and or ex uh, ex 
existential needs depending on the context. So that, I think that brings me to my next slide here. Um, spiritual health is balance. And I would say probably in most of our religions even, there needs to be balance. People often grow more spiritual through life as they become increasingly aware of their own meaning and purpose. Okay. In times of stress, um, they use previous ways of coping. Okay. And that might include spirituality, praying, those kinds of things. Um, now, here where we talk about, is religion the same as spirituality? No, it really isn't. It's a whole separate thing. It can, like I said, it can kind of branch off. It's usually a system of organized beliefs or worship, things, ceremonies, things that you do together, practices that outwardly express your spirituality. But in all reality, your spirituality is kind of what's embedded in like here. It's in ya, okay? In addition to spiritual care, religious care helps maintain uh, their faithfulness to their belief systems and practice, uh, worship practices. So there are times where you need to find out if your patient needs to take communion, okay? If they need a certain space that they need to pray in. If there's a uh, certain uh, people in their culture that they need to see. So everybody might just want not, want not want the old Lutheran pastor that hangs out at the hospital, right? Some people might want their own uh, religious practitioner or healer to come. And we need to find out about those things. Setting goals for spiritual care can be difficult because it is so personal. So you really have to ask those questions and not be afraid. But you have to know who you are as a person and what you believe in and not let that scare you, right, before you can ask other people. I heard, you know, some people talking about um, spirituality questions might be offensive to people and those kinds of things. But they're really only offensive if you ask them in an offensive way, right? I think if I was in a hospital and somebody asked me something about my spirituality or how I practiced what I believe, I don't know that that would be offensive unless they did something with that information that was cruel or unkind, right? Um, in fact, it's another thing like taking care of someone's hygiene. It's very personal, but let me tell you what, bad things don't grow on my arm. They grow in the cracks, the dark cracks of the world, right? So sometimes you have to approach those things, okay? You do not need to be an expert on every religion to care for people. Just remember that, okay? Uh, you need to be able to understand your own beliefs and not let them be a source of bias or fear or any of those things. And you need to be willing to ask questions and listen to your patient. So just remember, we are not human beings on a spiritual journey, but rather the spiritual beings on a human journey. So I think that's what we share as humans. Anybody have any questions on spirituality? How about in the city? Nothing questions? here. Nothing here. Well, I hope you... Oh, there's a question. Gina, what's your question? We will be tested on, but what we're about to learn, we're not getting tested on, like the marijuana stuff or... Marijuana is the only thing that's not being covered today. Everything else is being tested on. Does that make sense? Okay. And you, uh, someone here in Rochester asked about being tested on nutrition. Your actual lecture will come after your test, so nutrition will not be a part of your exam. Everything up to that will be. Try the best you can to get in a little bit of reading, okay, on nutrition. Um, nutrition usually follows an exam, so... I usually have a big heart for everybody studying for their first exam, but um, a lot of it, what we're going to cover is new material, not what you did in your nutrition courses. So, all right. It's, oh, Rainy, um, when did you want me to play this M? M uh, we'll cue you. It's at the end of the end of the um, okay. activity. Do we want right. to take a quick five-minute break, or do we want to go into yeah, the next? Yeah, take a quick five, and uh, Debbie can get set up, and away we'll go. All right, thanks so much. Okay, we're going to start uh, broadcasting from the Twin Cities. So, um, Alexis and Mike, if you can help us with that.
All right, Rochester, can you hear me? Wave at me if you can hear me, guys. Woohoo! All right. Uh, just uh, again, we are so lucky to have um, Debbie Ringdahl. Uh, she's one of the uh, key leaders over at the Center for Spirituality and Healing, uh, the group that put together the uh, online integrative um, thing that you watched. Uh, so I'm going to let her introduce herself. But I do want you to go ahead and um, get out the half sheet for the ICA, put your name on it, put the date, which is September 19th on it. Um, at the very end of class, we're going to ask you to reflect on something and write that down, and that'll be your ICA for the day. So without further ado, I'm going to allow uh, Debbie to introduce herself. Thank you, Debbie. It's very nice to be here with you today. I was sitting over there. Um sort of half listening, half not listening to the stuff you were being presented on. But I did hear over there in that group this like high excitement about the hand massage. So I'm going to just say that um, we're going to do that at the end. So um, yet, you know, I know you're super eager you know, to take that lotion and start rubbing it. Um, but we'll do that at the very end. So. Uh, I, my background, I've been teaching here at the School of Nursing since 1992. My uh, background is in midwifery. I actually graduated from nursing school in 1978 at St. Louis University, and one of my instructors was Ann Perry, one of the fundamental <gasps> nursing authors. So I, I saw that up on the screen. I thought, oh, yeah, I remember her. Uh, when she was really young, by the way, back then. So um, I graduated from midwifery uh, in the master's program in 1982. Was in clinical practice till 2005. I've been practicing Reiki, which is a hands-on healing technique since 1982, and I teach the Reiki classes through the Center for Spiritual and Healing. I co-direct the Integrative Health and Healing DMP program at the School of Nursing, and I've still been in the midwifery um, program teaching as well. So that's just a little bit about who I am. Um, next, of course, I need to know a little bit about who you are. So um, you are all sophomore nursing students, to have that right, that true answer as well, right? Second question is, how many of you here, um, hands up, I guess, at Rochester too, have worked as a, a nursing assistant in a long-term care facility or hospital? Looks like quite a few, I'm seeing quite a few hands up. And how many of you have been patients in a hospital? So again, quite a few. Uh, and of course, how many of you have visited somebody in a hospital? So pretty much everybody. So point being, I understand you're sophomore nursing students. You haven't yet had your first clinical experience as a student nurse, but you have all been in a hospital. And many of you, it sounds like, have also worked with um, patients and residents in hospitals and long-term care. So that, make, that means you're qualified, right, um, to learn things. And my job today... I just want to add, could we mute the mics in Rochester? We can hear, we're hearing a lot of uh, side noise. Okay, all right. Is that, that's what that was? Um, so uh, I'm here today to talk about integrative health. And so um, embedded in this is going to be two experientials. And the first of those will be a meditation. And then, as I already mentioned, the second of those will be a hand massage. And the M technique is one particular technique that was developed um, to help people be a little bit more systematic. And that's what this one this, uh, that you'll be looking at. So the meditation, actually, that I'm doing um, is going to be a little different than I've done in the past, Rainy. Um, and I don't at all mind that you turn the lights off. Um, but I have to get myself organized here. I have, not surprisingly, um, I hope that this is true for all of you, um, I've gotten, I think I've learned a few things over the years. Um, and so whenever I teach, I try to think about what I want to say to that group and what I think will be of greatest value to you. And meditation, I think, has become misunderstood off and on. I think there is a view that in order to do it well, you have to like 
super concentrate, you know, you have to achieve this sort of almost state of nirvana in order to, you know, to sort of say you've done it well. And who in here meditates, by the way? I'm just going to ask right now. Not very many. Okay, a few in Rochester. I started meditating in 1975. Um, and I've been doing it ever since. I know it's hard to believe. It's probably the only thing I've done for that many years. Um, I started it, and I, I do it every day, 20 minutes, on Transcendental Meditation. You get a mantra. And uh, it was in 1975 that Herbert Benson wrote the book, The Relaxation Response. And it is my opinion, my view, my lived experience, um, that, I, that the best thing you can do for yourself and the best thing you can do for other folks in your life, whether that's patients or residents or friends, is to help support the relaxation response. And the research that Herbert Benson did really illustrated that meditation does induce a relaxation response. But there's lots of other things that do as well. I practiced Reiki, as I said, since 1982. That also induces a relaxation response. So a part of what I'm going to talk about today with you all is integrative health in general, but I'd like you to hold that notion that there are some very basic things that we can do that aren't a modality per se, but rather they invite you to help people get into a state of relaxation. And the research around the relaxation response is compelling. People who are able to have a state of relaxation every day have Im immune system boosting, decreased stress, and probably in general just better capacity to manage whatever they're dealing with, whether it's chronic pain or chronic illness. So I decided um, to bring out the relaxation response book from Herbert Benson. I haven't done this before. I found it on my computer while I was half listening today to everything else. And back in 1975, and this was really groundbreaking work at the time, um, Herbert Benson developed what he considered to be a very, very simple and basic way to support people learning how to meditate. And so I'm going to just walk that through with you, and it'll just be a couple of minutes. Okay, so sit quietly in a comfortable position. Close your eyes. I'd like you to start with your feet and go up through your lower legs and your knees all the way up feeling a sense of relaxation as you keep going up, 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 up through, up to your abdomen, all the way up, chest, neck, face, crown of your head. Now I'd like you to breathe through your nose. and out through your mouth. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. As you breathe out, say the word one silently to yourself. Breathe in And out as you're saying one. In through your nose and out one. Just breathe easily and naturally. I'm going to give you about a minute to continue that. Just breathing in through your nose. Out as you say one, as you exhale. In. Thank you. 
easy breathing in. Word one as you exhale. Get into your own rhythm. Get into your own state of relative relaxation. You'll likely feel the muscles start to loosen a bit. Get into your own rhythm, your own cadence. As you do your next two inhalations and then one out. Last inhalation. And then you can just breathe normally. And as you feel comfortable, you can open your eyes. These are the other things that Herbert Benson says in that list. Do not worry about whether you are successful in achieving a deep level of relaxation. Maintain a passive attitude and permit relaxation to occur at its own pace. When distracting thoughts occur, try to ignore them by not dwelling upon them and returning to repeating one. With practice, the response should come with little effort. Practice the technique once or twice daily And you can choose any soothing word, preferably with no meaning or association. So just a few minutes of commentary. Um, Any thoughts about that experience? Hard, easy, neutral? Did anybody almost fall asleep? Yes. And that is, by the way, what happens when you get into a state of relaxation. And my experience is students are typically sleep deprived, which means that whenever you get relaxed, you're more likely to fall asleep. So did anybody feel good? Yes. All right. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, just a little sample. All right, I'm going to go into content now. Um, I would hardly support anybody that feels like they want to try that every day. It's a good thing. Um, The recommendation um, in the meditation literature and the research literature is to do that twice a day for 10 to 20 minutes. The therapeutic effects are considered to be greater um, when you can maintain that over a little bit longer period of time. Um, Like I said, I do teach Reiki as well. Um, and Reiki is a hands-on healing uh, technique, I would say, but it also does um, frequently get people into a meditative state and also induces a relaxation response. Debbie, could I add one thing? Yeah. Um, I had the fortune of graduating here with my doctoral program, and I actually took a Reiki class for credit with... uh, with Debbie, it was great, and one of my students from the baccalaureate. So keep in mind that for some of your electives, we have classes in the Center for Spirituality and Healing that you could take. So keep those in mind. Yeah. Don't get me started, Randy. Really. <laughs> that would be like, okay, you do have that option, and you don't have that option in any other university in the country. Correct. The Center for Spirituality and Healing is a very unique department. We have eight classes that we offer. And many of the skill-based classes, the ones that integrative health and healing students are required to take, are one or two credits. So I usually go for the Reiki class in a two-day format, back-to-back over a weekend. So um, just another way of um, what I consider to be enhancing and supporting your capacity to provide um, very integrative, holistic nursing care. So you have in front of you now on the screen these two pictures. Um, In addition to um, what I just said about the notion that I think the relaxation response has capacity to support everybody, 
I also, um, I'm a very pragmatic person, and I believe that we're more likely to do things and use them if they're easy to use, you know, like they're something that we can access easily and quickly. Um, and that's to me what comes in the words portability and low hanging fruit. So even though I know that there's all sorts of activities one can get participating out there, um, like running, for example, jogging, um, it takes a lot of time, you know, and you can do any other kind of activity, um, like swimming, let's go with that one, you know, it takes even more time. So to whatever degree you can find something for yourself that you feel like is easy to do and easy to use, you will use it more. And that's true for your patients as well. So when you're working with people who are in a situation where they're sick or in pain, you're more likely to use the things that are easier to use. And so that's what I want to invite you to think about as, as well. Learning fruit uh, and portability. Uh, by the way, I have two sons. One is 28 and one is 32. Um, my 28-year-old is a veterinarian. He's reminded me over and over again whenever I talk about health care and I'm talking about human health care, um, just in case, you know, I've forgotten that there's a whole other animal kingdom. So that's really informed my thinking quite a lot about health and health care. Um, my other son has made a comment to me once um, when I was, I guess, dealing with people that weren't being very nice to me. He said, you know, Mom, it's just low-hanging fruit to be nice. And I thought, yeah, really good point. Yeah, he scored that big time with me that day. You know, it's, it's really low hanging fruit. It's not that hard. It's not that hard to reach out and be nice to people. And the yield is really high. So um, the other part of my um, work life has been to be involved in the, what we consider to be kind of the newly developed um, model of care called integrative nursing. It is, um, we have a book that we put together in 2014 and 2000. 18 and what what started as a group of folks sitting around talking about what the principles were has turned into a few other things so you have in front of you a card um, and more than anything what i wanted to do was just to invite you all and i will invite you to think with me you know how these particular principles translate and i'm aware that you haven't been in clinical practice yet um, these are what we consider to be foundational to the practice of nursing I'm Mary Jo Kreitzer, and I co-direct the Integrative Health and Healing Program, and she is the Center Director for the Bakken Center for Spiritual and Healing. And it is her opinion that we shouldn't really even be calling this integrative nursing, we should be calling it nursing. So in other words, the notion that we should be practicing this all the time anyway is really what's embedded in the principles. Um, but human beings are inseparable from their environments, principle number one. Human beings have the innate capacity for health and well-being. Nature has healing and restorative properties that contribute to health and well-being. Integrative nursing is person-centered and relationship-based. And the fifth one is probably the one I'll be using most today as we go through some of the content. Um, and it's probably the one that has influenced me the most, frankly. Integrative nursing practice is informed by evidence and uses a full range of therapeutic modalities to support and augment the healing process, moving from least intensive invasive to more, depending on need and context. And then last is uh, integrative nursing focuses on the health and well-being of caregivers as well as those they serve. So that kind of fits under that umbrella of self-care that I suspect yeah. by now you've heard of a few times in your... This is Dawn from Rochester. Oh. Could you see if someone could share your presentation here in Rochester? We're not seeing it. Okay. Um, and if someone could check the audio, we're getting a lot of echo. Are you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we've been working on it. All right, so um, I'll just tell a little story here while we're, we're doing that. Um, this fifth principle, least to most, I believe is a particular value to nursing because we do have, as nurses, autonomy. And that is what Dawn mentioned when she talked about the independent practices. In other words, you don't need... You don't need uh, anybody to tell you to, to use ice. You don't need anybody to tell you to do a heating pack. You don't need anybody to tell you um, to do a hand massage. So those are 
those are ways of approaching care that have independence. If you think about pain as a common experience that people have when they're in the hospital, although that would be true in a lot of settings as well, um, we, we would suggest, we want to say that the first thing you do isn't to pull out a narcotic, but rather you're going to start with something that is least invasive, least intensive. You know, my background is in childbirth, right? I was a nurse, I was a nurse midwife, delivered babies. Um, the big deal in childbirth, at least back in the 70s and 80s, um, was teaching women deep breathing. And the notion that you can get into a state of relaxation with altered breathing was what was used to mitigate pain. Least invasive, you know, versus an epidural, which would be considered the most invasive, um, certainly with side effects. Doesn't mean that everybody shouldn't or should have an epidural, but really the notion is that there are side effects. The more invasive and intensive, the greater the likelihood is that you're going to have a side effect. So um, it looks like they still don't. Okay, um, but the other, I wanted to just share a little story with you. When in 2006, um, which now is 13 years ago, my dad, when he was 82, um, and he passed away three years ago now, when he was 92, he developed West Nile encephalitis. And um, I don't know if any of you know what that is. It's bad news. Um, he, when I got to the hospital, he was already a do not resuscitate. His systems were all shutting down. Um, and so, um, you know, he basically was just receiving, you know, I would say comfort care. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to be there and um, give him Reiki. And I was on the night shift with the nurses that 10 days he was in the hospital. And I saw them doing all these things that were on that list of independent care. I saw them using heat. I, I saw them using high, uh, ice. I saw them using the position changes. They were changing the bedding. He was agitated. He was hallucinating. But they could not give him narcotics because he had a central nervous system depressed system. And so he only could get Tylenol. And he was in unremitting pain. And so I was so happy I could give him Reiki because it would bring his pain down from 10 to 6. And actually that was a really kind of a powerful experience for me. He went on to live for another 10 years. He survived, which was pretty amazing. Um, he had minimal um, impairment following that. He had two months in rehab to help him kind of get his muscles back. But um, I just started thinking a lot more about why I had kept Reiki so separate from nursing and decided that I was going to do a bit a better job at combining them. So that's a little bit more than you needed to know. But um, it also, to me, is a really good illustration of the least to most, because you don't always have the option of giving people pain medications. And for anybody who's been in pain, pain medications don't always work either. You know, there's limits to how much they can really do. So to whatever degree you can sort of develop a larger repertoire of other things to use is really going to be helpful. One of the integrative health and healing students that I have worked with worked on an oncology unit, and she said that after um, the opioid crisis became apparent and the doctors on the floor weren't giving the patients narcotics very much anymore, the nurses didn't know what to do. You know, which is kind of a sad situation, you know, that that was so much the primary way of managing pain. So it looks like Rochester doesn't have this, so I'm just going to keep going, pretending like they do. Um, oh, they have, you guys are going to have to work off the PowerPoint that you can download from Canvas. There's no difference between what she's got and what you can download off of Canvas. So it's all, it's available for you. That's what I was mentioning earlier. And then uh, when we move to the DVD, there's a DVD that, um, for the M technique that Don will have it. Um, we've been working on it even before you asked. Um, we're just having an issue, and I apologize. Thank you. Well, wow, Randy, you really have a nice, loud voice. That's, <laughs> I can hear every single thing you're saying. It's so good. Um, so in these six principles that you have the, um, you know, that list of and that I kind of went over, um, what we are doing increasingly in our sort of like 
sort of group of folks that are invested in this model of care is looking more closely at exactly what you can do to make those happen. In other words, they aren't just concepts, but you translate them in terms of direct care. And I think it's easier to see the fifth principle as a translationable thing that, you know, least to most. But these are examples of actual things one does to support those principles, and I suspect they are the things that you've already thought about and perhaps have even done in the work that you've done as a nursing assistant, that when you are working with people, you try to be mindful of the fact that they have other people in their lives and other things that are important to them, maybe put them around them, that you support who they are at that deeper level, and that would be what I would call that spiritual plane so that when you're actually conversing with them, you get to understand that things are most important to them and can remind them of those when they need it. Uh, the the, the nature-based is probably a little easier to imagine that that would be a good thing. It's hard to achieve that in most hospitals. Um, one of the long-term care facilities that I um, have worked at, they actually have activities for the folks in the, maybe some of you have seen this before, where they they allow the residents to do things with potting plants or bringing in things so that they can sort of engage a little bit more closely with nature. Um, of course, relationship-based care, again, is considered to be good nursing care, right? You get to know who people are. And we've talked about the fifth. And for the number six, this might be something you want to think about. You can add this to your list of things that you're going to learn to do after today, like maybe, you know, spending 10 or 15 minutes every day, you know, with that meditative activity to develop a personal plan for yourself so that you can keep up whatever amount of self-care that you've been able to achieve on a daily basis. And it's not easy. You know, I'm, I'm here to say um, that everything that you do that you can retain, even if it's for five minutes a day, it does make a difference, but it's hard to make time for everything. And so just don't think you can. I don't think it's a realistic expectation, quite frankly, to do everything all the time. Um, but if you prioritize, you can always find five or ten minutes for yourself every day. I don't know what the title of the slide is. Okay, integrative holistic health is a philosophy, not a modality. Um, what I am wanting to convey with this slide is that even though when people hear the word integrative health, they are more likely to think of a modality, it's way bigger than that. We are more and more using the word or phrase integrative approach. So in other words, if you say integrative health, people are more likely to think, oh yeah, I had a massage when I was in the hospital, or oh yeah, aromatherapy. You know, I'm really interested in that. And those are nice opportunities to learn different ways of supporting comfort, reducing pain. But providing an integrative approach is way bigger than that. And that is why I really start out with the notion that the simple activities that you do are just as valuable as anything more complicated. I did want you all to just have a basic idea of what the classification is for the integrative um, practices. The National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, which formed in 1991, changed its name in 2014 to the National Center for Complementary and in Integrative Health. And the reason for that is because our system has shifted enough now to offer integrative approaches, integrative modalities into mainstream healthcare. So it's been viewed not just as complementary, which is in addition to, or alternative instead of, but actually integrated into. Um, so if you look at the classification system, you can really see there's just two different groups, and there's a mind-body with a long list there, and then natural products, which is primarily herbs. Um, aromatherapy, vitamins, minerals, probiotics. So in this group here, um, I'm going to ask how many folks have had acupuncture? I'm always, you know, there's always a few in Rochester, right? Okay, so how many have you had a massage? Yeah, popular. Um, and I already talked a little bit about meditation. How many in here have practiced Tai Chi or Jigong, either of those? Okay, a couple people. Okay. 
Um, anybody here had um, uh, cranial sacral? It's a form of spinal manipulation, okay? Um, and yoga, popular, right? Yoga is very popular, I see, of all of the modalities these days. Um, and energy therapies, anybody had healing touch, Reiki, or therapeutic touch in here? Yeah, a couple people. So, um, and aromatherapy, I'm assuming, guessing, that would be another sort of popular. This um, was a survey that was done in 2010. It's a little old. It hasn't been updated, so I don't have a, no, a newer version of it. But you can see that these are the, the list. Um, uh, a lot of hospitals were surveyed. I don't remember how many, a lot, um, to find out what the most common um, integrative approaches and therapies were used in hospitals. And you can see here that at that time, 10 years ago, pet therapy was the most frequent popular followed by massage, music, guided imagery, relaxation training, energy therapies at 21%, aromatherapy and acupuncture. I would wager a guess that most of those are higher now. It's more frequently used in hospitals and long-term care facilities than it was 10 years ago. So for those of you here who work um, in a role as a, as a nursing assistant, how many, have you, how many of you have seen any of these modalities used? Okay, and which ones have you seen? Just um, where I work actually follows the integrative. It's in partnership with the U of M, so it actually does like all of the six. They have a tree. The nursing, yeah, yeah. It's a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about over there? What? I did a home care, but it's a lot of massage therapy and music therapy. My massage therapy, music therapy. Um, I worked at a hospital, and they have a massage therapist. Massage therapist. Okay. Massage therapist as well. Massage. Any? What about over here? Um, there's pet therapy, massage therapy, music therapy. Um, okay. Where was where that? Um, I worked at a nursing home in Elk River. Okay. Cool. Over there, and anybody else? Um, at a nursing home, we had pet massage and music therapy. Okay. So, actually, it kind of fits with these, doesn't it? The ones that were most popular, pet. Massage music. The slide that I received from um, Don, you know, talked about the notion that there were a variety of things you could do as independent providers, and I think it's important that you all know here in Minnesota there's a statement of accountability for utilization of integrative therapies in nursing practice. It was developed in the 90s. It was updated, um, I think, in 2010. And it provides a list of the parameters for integrative therapy use among nurses. And then there's general guidelines that are provided. So, for example, even though I agree with the list that she provided you with um, the different kinds of um, modalities that you can practice as a nurse, you need to have knowledge and training before you practice some of them. And that would be true for healing touch or Reiki or aromatherapy, that it isn't... Um, I myself have learned a lot about aromatherapy in the last couple of years. I think it's a tendency for people to think it's just something you can sprinkle around and, you know, it'll make people feel good. And there's really a chemistry and a science behind it. And there are um, risks to some of the different um, essential oils. So it's important to know what you're doing. And again, just a repetition, uh, least, um, least invasive Modalities are those that can be safely administered and for those which there's evidence supporting effectiveness and symptom management. And in the, um, the integrative nursing book, rather than breaking it into modalities, we broke the chapters on symptom management into symptoms. And so these are the symptoms that we ended up looking at and then identifying the different ways of um, supporting health and healing. So you can see pain, anxiety, stress, nausea, fatigue, sleep, mood disorders, cognitive impairment, and spiritual distress. In the second edition, um, we realized somehow we had inadvertently missed GI disturbances. I can't, don't know how that happened. Forgot that people have stomach aches, I guess, so we added that. Um, and so in all of these, you know, and I just added that kind of to reinforce the notion that relaxation can make a difference. Touch therapies, the relaxation response um, can all um, provide support for those. In looking at how to go from least to most, um, this isn't something that you need to memorize or even in particular um, 
feel like you get clearly, but the idea from least to most is that you're moving from those things that you can actually teach people and patients and residents to do themselves all the way to that which requires complete medical coverage. So when I gave you the example of a woman in labor, clearly you can teach a woman how to use deep breathing to help her with um, pain management. You obviously need an anesthesiologist or a nurse anesthetist to do the epidural. So you're moving from all the way where you can actually support people learning things for themselves with your support to needing complete, um, you know, medical help. And you've already talked quite a lot about pain, um, and this is my way of saying that probably. You know, in the systems that you're going to be working in, pain, anxiety, and nausea are probably the symptoms you're going to be managing the most, just because those are the reasons why people are typically in the hospitals. And this is, again, the Joint Commission's uh, statement that was made in 2015, which has changed, um, quite frankly, the capacity for both medicine and nursing, uh, you know, to provide the same kind of support for pain management. So now pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic are both being required for all hospitals and facilities that offer pain management. This is an example of some of the tier one. And starting out again, if you think about, you know, the things that will allow you to get into the sort of relaxed state or relaxation response, deep breathing, imagery, music, prayer, um, those are all examples of that. And moving into the more um, potential need for others. So you have to work, for example, to teach people how to perform Tai Chi, how to perform Qigong, how to learn yoga. One of the students that I worked with on her um, project and in the, the DNP program, all the students are required to do a quality improvement project for your future, if you ever think that that might be something you want to do. It's going into a healthcare facility, identifying a problem, and then developing an intervention. And so this student was in a long-term care facility working, um, doing her clinicals, and decided that she wanted to support the folks there so that they would be at lower risk to have falls. So she, uh, she was of Chinese origin. Um, she did a dedicated um, two or three months of Tai Chi training and brought the Tai Chi into the assisted living facility so that this, the folks there over 12 weeks were able to get um, the Tai Chi program and she taught the other folks in there how to, how to teach so that when she left they were, they're still offering it now. So she had really good outcomes. There was definitely a decreased fall risk uh, attached to the folks that were participating in the Tai Chi program. And again, you can see the the shift here, you know, from least to most. Um, and the whole systems, such as traditional Chinese medicine, also fits into that category, since not everybody can put in needles or cup or use the, um, the other devices that you see up here. And last are the pharmacologic, surgical, and nerve blocks. Let's see what time are we at. Okay, I'm still doing all right. So in my mind, these are examples of the things that you can do that have the greatest capacity probably to work effectively with the folks who are presenting with pain. And so um, we've already talked a lot about the deep breathing, um, but these others are, are skills that you can learn. And another plug for the center classes, there's a one credit on aromatherapy. There's a two credit on guided imagery. Um, there's a one credit on Reiki. Um, there's a one credit on acupressure. Um, so, uh, you know, again, these as has been, the other speaker talked about toolbox. That's exactly what this is. It becomes an extension of who you are. Again, you can use your hands. Back to my key concepts, right? Portability. low-hanging fruit. I consider touch to be obviously portable and a low-hanging fruit. Um, your hands are always available to you to use. I believe that in the majority of cases, not always, but in most cases, 
touch is viewed as being very therapeutic. I don't think anybody ever really gets enough touch. Um, I talk about this a lot when I teach the Reiki classes because it's a very light hands-on technique. Um, I remember hearing once that everybody should get 25 hugs a day. I don't know if you've heard that. I don't even know if the number's right. But hugs are short. They don't last very long. Um, and so I think that nobody, nobody gets sustained sustain touch. It just doesn't happen. Um, and that's particularly true for people that are older. So I have you know, a lot of probably opinions and feelings about that. I think if there's any group of people you know, on the planet that could stand to get more touch, it's people that are older, specifically those that are living in senior living facilities. It's hard actually going into those places. I don't know if any of you who work there feel that. I feel like there's a lot of sadness there, you know, when you're working with people who don't have family visit them, you know, who are isolated and alone. Um, and touch does provide an avenue, you know, for being present with another human being um, and creating a sense of connection and community. And there's been a lot written over the years about nurse being their own sort of like vessel of healing. And I don't know if that sounds hokey to you, um, but I think it comes partly out of this kind of thinking that you become the person that does show you care through the way you interact and treat people. And so one way of doing that is by touching people in kind and therapeutic ways. The other, I, you know, I, I didn't say anything about mindfulness um, separately. I think that mindfulness obviously is another word that's getting used a lot. You've heard it before, right? Um, does anybody want to take a stab at what it means? No. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I think it means being present. Yeah. Being like in the moment. Being in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a tough thing to do. Um, most days, you know, there's always things going through your head. Meditation is one way to achieve a sense of mindfulness. Um, and, you know, for many people, it's truly just recognizing that when you're in a situation, you want to stay focused on that thing. And there's a lot of different authors who've talked about how to support that in nursing. Uh, Jean Watson talks about taking a pause every time before you walk into a room washing your hands and thinking, I'm going to be with that person during the time I'm in the room. And then when you come out, sort of foam in, foam out, foam in mindfulness, foam out mindfulness. Uh, and yeah, again, I, um, I, I'm not, I, it's interesting, I, I just taught a Reiki class this weekend, and um, one person out of 15 said she just didn't like to be touched. And we chatted a bit about whether or not that would be a challenge for her, and she did fine in the class. Um, and I think that's certainly something that does show up off and on again, and you have to be mindful of it. But typically, I think people find themselves wanting to have a little bit more of that kind of connection. You know, there's a physical care for those who are nursing assistants. You do it already. It demonstrates comfort. It provides emotional support, particularly when people are suffering or in pain. I think it shows kindness, certainly connection, and then just plain contact. Um, I, I feel rather pleased that I can tell you that in 1950, my mother graduated from Fairview Hospital Nursing School. Um, so I'm like the second generation. And so do the math, 70 years ago. And nurses gave massages to everybody. That was a part of their job. You never took care of a patient without performing a massage as a part of nursing care. There was always a back rub before bedtime, and a massage was embedded into the bed bath. So the notion that now we have massage therapists coming, you know, to actually give people massages in the hospital is lovely. Um, but there's also certainly other ways of doing it, which of course is our segue to the hand massage. So the notion that you can do a, a smaller version, that you have opportunities you know, to um, hold somebody's hand or their feet and give them a three to five minute massage. Um, I'm going to just insert this one little piece of research before we start. 
Another one of the students I worked with who is a DMP student was a FNP student actually, family nurse practitioner, and she had worked in a chemotherapy infusion unit as a nurse in Utah that had a lot of different modalities available for the patients. And when she came to um, Iowa, University of Iowa, that's where I'm from, by the way. There was nothing there. And she wanted to do a, dot, a DMP project and wanted to hire a massage therapist to come in and give everybody a massage, which sounds lovely, but it's not feasible and it's not sustainable. And so she kind of went back to the drawing board and found that there was one particular medication that required 15 minutes of, of bedside nursing time. So the nurse had to sit there with the patient. And so she taught them the t technique you're going to be learning. And for that, for everybody that had that medication, they got a, you know, they had 15 minutes of this. And she had in extremely good outcomes. Um, the themes that came through were there was a, you know, increased relationship. They felt more um, comfortable, and they took their, it took their mind off. So, um, you know, you all will get opportunities in your, you know, 40 or 50 years in front of you as a nurse to figure out, you know, what it is you want to do. Um, but I already heard that vote of confidence for the hand massage. It's amazing. It's amazing what, you know, three to five minutes of holding somebody's hand and doing that can really yield. So um, this is a 5-5 five -five, um, video that you'll partner, and then one person gives, the other person receives, and then you, re then you flip. And I think we have just kind of enough time to do that. So. Everyone should choose a partner. You should have one towel between the two of you. You will rest, one of you will rest your um, hand and your elbow there. What's important is we are going to play the video. Okay, choose now who's going to give the massage first. Make that decision in your pair. All right, now, it is very important the person who is the nurse giving it, you need to be doing it simultaneously with the DVD. Then when it's done, we will play it again, you'll flip rolls. And um, it's important to give and it's also important to receive and there's going to be insights to that. After you are done, please fill out the ICA with two things that um, were meaningful or interesting or that came up for you from this experience. Your insights from having this experience. The last thing I'd like to say is that um, at the Minneapolis VA, the M technique is a technique that is trained to every employee and there is a check off during orientation. So every employee at the VA hospital here in Minneapolis learns this technique. The video that, you're, that we're using was actually developed for the pediatric bone marrow transplant unit for teaching parents. So it might seem a little humorous to you when you look and see little, the small hands that are being used, but that's why. It's for children. All right. Brainy? Yeah, uh, Brainy? Yes. I need to know, since I have no help here now, okay. how to this DVD. So I tried the media media player. All right, let's try projecting it from the Twin Cities and see how. Can you see anything from here? Oh, let oh me that see. would be no. Not unless they show. Unless they put the c camera towards the PowerPoint, then we can. Alexis, let's try that. Alexis is our expert in the control room. Um, actually, if Mike or Alexis could come out, I'm having a little bit of a problem about which one to, which button to get this started with. He showed me. Okay. Remind me. Okay. Yeah, but I pressed this, but I don't know how to. I forgot. You told me which button to press. Uh, she's.
Rainey, I think mine is working. M Technique is a form of structured touch that will help your child to relax. It can be used on children and adolescents of both genders and all ages. In addition to M Technique soothing your child, your child can also use this. This is a demonstration of a parent performing M Technique on her child's hand. Apply lotion or cream to the lower part of the arm with three slow, gentle stroking movements. Mm -hmm. Do it with the video. Holding your child's hand between your hands. Use your thumbs to smooth out the back of the hand in straight, horizontal movements from the center to the edge of the hand. Work your way from the wrist to the knuckles. The number of horizontal strokes needed to cover the area will depend on the size of your child's hand. For a small child, two would be enough, but for a larger hand, you may need up to five. Repeat the horizontal strokes three times. The next motion is joint circling. Holding the thumb, work your way down the little finger first. Circle the first joint three times. Use one smooth stroke to the next knuckle and circle it three times. With another smooth stroke down to the third knuckle, circle it three times as well. As you reach the end of each finger, Hold the finger between your second and third finger like a pair of scissors and press lightly at the tip. End with one final downward stroke. As you reach the end of each finger, hold the finger between your second and third finger like a pair of scissors and press lightly at the tip. End with one final downward stroke. Depending on the size of your child's hands, you will notice you need to change your hold from the supporting thumb hold to the small finger hold to reach all fingers. When you've completed the back of the hand, turn the hand over. 
Link your little fingers through your child's little and fourth fingers so that their hand is facing up between your two upturned palms. Using your thumbs only, stretch out the palm of the hand using horizontal strokes, working from wrist area to knuckles. Repeat this sequence three times. When you finish the third sequence, slide your hand into a handshake hold. Supporting your child's hand, stroke the lower arm, allowing your child's arm and hand to rest on the bed. All right, what we're going to do now is we've gone a little bit over, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to play it again. If you need to go for transportation or child care or whatever it is, you can leave. It's it's. Well, there are parents in our class, um, so I, I want to m make that you aware of that. Um, I'm going to play it again. It's optional. Uh, as for the ICA, you can write one or two sentences. That will be sufficient. Um, and so I'm going to start playing it again now. This is a, a demonstration one, of a parent performing M technique on her child's hand. Apply lotion or cream to the lower part of the arm with three slow, gentle stroking movements. Holding your child's hand between your hands, use your thumbs to smooth out the back of the hand in straight, horizontal movements from the center to the edge of the hand. Work your way from the wrist to the knuckles. The number of horizontal strokes needed to cover the area will depend on the size of your child's hand. For a small child, two would be enough, but for a larger hand, you may need up to five. Repeat the horizontal strokes three times. The next motion is joint circling. Holding the thumb, work your way down the little finger first. Circle the first joint three times. Use one smooth stroke to the next knuckle and circle it three times. With another smooth stroke down to the third knuckle, circle it three times as well. As you reach the end of each finger, hold the finger between your second and third finger like a pair of scissors and press lightly at the tip. End with one final downward stroke. As you reach the end of each finger, hold the finger between your second and third finger like a pair of scissors and press lightly at the tip. End with one final downward stroke. Depending on the size of your child's hands, you will notice you need to change your hold from the supporting thumb hold to the small finger hold to reach all fingers.
When you've completed the back of the hand, turn the hand over. Link your little fingers through your child's little and fourth fingers so that their hand is facing up between your two upturned palms. Using your thumbs only, stretch out the palm of the hand using horizontal strokes, working from wrist area to knuckles. Repeat this sequence three times. I'm super impressed with you guys that are staying to do this. Wow. Good job. When you finish the third sequence, slide your hand into a handshake hold. Supporting your child's hand, stroke the lower arm, allowing your child's arm and hand to rest on the bed.